Presented by Caltech. Good evening. It's a pleasure to, and an honor to introduce the speaker for tonight's Ernest C. Watson lecture, Professor Marina Agronoff. Professor Agronoff received a bachelor's degree from St. Petersburg's Technical University, a master's degree from Tel Aviv, and her PhD in economics from New York University, 2010. As you've noticed, she's been moving slowly south and west. She joined the, the, she joined the Caltech faculty as an assistant professor of economics in 2010 and was promoted to professor of economics last spring. Professor Agronoff's research, like so many of our colleagues, tackles difficult problems that span several disciplines. In Marina's case, her work spans both economics and political science when she focuses on how communication affects group decision. It also spans psychology and economics when she considers why individuals seem to have random preferences when facing certain types of uncertainty. In her work, she brings to bear a variety of tools, but most notably the experimental approach. Most economists are either theoretical and develop mathematical models of, humans, of human behavior and uh, 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 market interaction, or empirical and then analyze data produced by humans in the real world. Marina is part of a rarer kind of economist, one that runs experiments. A good experimentalist like Marina has to be a Jane of all trades because she has to be adept at theory if she's going to set up the experiments properly and good at data since the experiments produce large amounts of information to be analyzed. This is a tradition pioneered at Caltech in the 1970s where researchers brought students in, the lab in a laboratory setting to play economic games and where students were paid as a function of their performance. For example, in an auction, you're simply paid the value you have been assigned times the number of units you own at the end of the game. This allowed economists to measure the impact of market rules on outcomes of economic games with important consequences for design of a variety of markets in the last three decades that have had a global impact. Rena continues this excellent tradition with her work on public goods provision, taxation inequality, and on committees. Tonight, she will speak on negotiation and group decisions, passing bills with backroom deal. Please join me in welcoming my colleague and friend, Marina Agronoff. Thank you for this, for this kind introduction, and thank you guys for coming to today's lecture. So I'm gonna talk about bargaining and negotiations. Uh, I'm not gonna surprise you by saying that bargaining is everywhere in many, many spheres of our lives. I bargain with my um, husband and my son often about many issues at home. So do the budget committees bargain about the divisions of scarce resources when they need to allocate them to different goals. And so do the corporate boards and faculty meetings are often about bargaining and so forth. Taking this one step up, legislators, one of their main jobs is to allocate the scarce resources between constituencies with different preferences. Everyone wants a bigger piece. How are we gonna do that? We don't have infinite amount of resources. Bargaining often involves negotiations. Negotiations are probably the most interesting and essential part of the bargaining. People talk before they start voting on bills or motions on the floor. Another interesting feature about bargaining is that it's very, very different depending on what situation you're looking at. Bargaining differs by number of people who are involved in this process, by rules and procedures that we use to bring the motions to the floor and vote on them and pass the decisions, and also whether or not people are allowed to communicate with each other and in what, uh, through what channels. So what I'm gonna try to do today is I'm gonna talk about how do negotiations, this process of talking before the actual bargaining happens, affects bargaining uh, behavior and ultimately bargaining outcomes. And how do different rules that different committees and groups of people use interact with communication channels and eventually impacts bargaining outcomes? So to set up the stage, let me start with the classical bargaining problem, which is called the ultimatum game. This is the problem between two people, um, the proposer and the responder. One of them, the proposer, is given $10 and is asked to allocate this $10 between him and the responder. So the proposer can choose 
any amount of x, anything between 0 and $10, which will be the share of the responder. The responder in this game can either accept the proposed allocation or reject it. If the allocation is accepted, then the responder gets x, whatever the proposer give, uh, gave him, and the proposer gets the rest, 10 minus x. If the responder rejects this proposal, then both people get nothing. This is a very uh, well-studied and classical problem in bargaining. And let me try to convince you that this structure is actually very useful to think about real-life situations. Let me start with a little example about myself. Uh, me and my brother often argued which video game we we're going to play. And eventually, our parents would get tired of that and would say, either you guys agree on what you're doing or you're getting no video games. Then one of us, usually my wiser brother, brother would scream the name of the game, and I would be left in the situation of this responder. I could agree with that, and then we get to play the game that he wants, or we get nothing. Moving away from this little example to real-life situations, think about the labor strikes. Oftentimes, the management of the company offers some terms to workers. Workers can agree to these terms and then continue generating profit according to this agreement, or they can refuse this proposal and go on strike, in which case both sides are losing money. So this very, very stylized and simple game actually cap captures um, real trade-offs that people face when we bargain with each other. So what should we expect to happen in such a game? One theory that tells us what should we expect in this game comes from uh, equilibrium analysis. So equilibrium analysis is such a mathematical state in which everybody in the game have figured out what others are doing. In this game, we assume that people like more money rather than less money. So if you give me $100, I prefer that to having $10. If that's the case, then the proposer can think backwards through this game and think the following. Well, responder likes money. So if I offer him even one cent, it's better than having nothing, which means that the responder should accept any amount that I will give him, in which case the proposer can appropriate essentially the whole amount of $10 and give just a tiny bit to the responder so that the responder says yes. So that's a prediction of economic theory. And I'm going to use these predictions as the reference point. And we're going to see that in some cases, economic theory gives us predictions that um, are consistent with how people behave, and in other cases, not so much. But what do actually people do in this situation? When people actually play this game, then the behavior is quite different. First of all, despite the fact that any positive amount should be accepted by the responder, responders tend to reject low offers. And given that behavior, proposers take that into account and offer the responders on average between 30 and 40% of the pie, in which case these offers are accepted. What do you think would happen if in this situation, before playing this game, responder and proposer can talk to each other? Or going back to my example with my brother, if before one of us screams, my parents would say, you guys talk first, then agree on something and tell us what you're going to do, then you can imagine that the outcomes would be quite different. I was quite persuasive from early age. So I would convince my brother it's only fair if we play some game that we both like, in which case the frequency of disagreements would decrease, and the shares of proposers and responders would come closer to each other. And that's exactly what happens when people play these games with real money at stake when they can talk to each other before bargaining. So in this particular case, negotiations seem to promote egalitarian allocations, right? They create more fair allocations among the bargainers. So this example of the ultimatum game and the effects that negotiations have on the bargaining outcomes um, was my starting point uh, when I started thinking about how groups negotiate over the fixed amount of budget and how the negotiations within groups can change the bargaining outcomes. So today, I'm going to show you a series of uh, experiments and projects which deal with multilateral bargaining, the situation in which the committee with more than two people bargain over some fixed amount of resources. 
And the problem is that each person was the higher part of these resources, higher share of these resources. So the two main research questions that I'm going to ask is, how do negotiations affect these bargaining outcomes? And what is the mechanism that drives these changes in outcomes? So one way to think about the bargaining situation is the following. I'm ultimately interested in bargaining outcomes. What happens? How do we divide a pie? To get to the bargaining outcomes, I'm going to use the bargaining rules and the communication channels. These are the negotiation processes between the bargainers, which interact with each other, that are going to affect this black circle, which is bargaining behavior and bargaining process. So in other words, the rules that the committees and different groups use to reach decisions affect how we interact with each other. And that, in turn, affects the bargaining outcomes. What I would really like to do is imagine myself as the engineer of the group decision making. I would like to understand how different rules and how different communication channels affect the final outcomes. However, getting the field data for this exercise is quite uh, hard. And the reason is that, ideally, I would like to observe exactly the same bargaining situation with the same number of bargainers, with the same budget, with the same rules used by the committee, with one tiny difference in the, for example, whether people can talk to or not to each other before they start bargaining, and observe how these two identical committees, except for this one element, uh, fare uh, with each other. What happens at the very end? Field data um, doesn't provide me with such flexibility. So I'm going to need to find another way to empirically study these questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the combination of economic theory and laboratory experiments. So economic theory is used as the reference point. So this is, uh, uh, economic theory is based on the principles of rational choice theory. And the way I'm thinking about the economic theory is that it's the tool that allows me to separate the cheap talk from the logically coherent statement that come from transparent assumptions. In other words, economic theory tells me if my set of assumptions are correct about the situation I'm studying, the preferences that people have in the situation, and so forth, then the following outcome should be observed in the situation. I'm not saying that's how people should behave. I'm just saying that it's the lens through which I'm going to look at the data to assess whether this particular theory makes sense or not. But ultimately, I'm interested in how people do behave in these situations. So for that, I'm going to need the help of laboratory experiments. What are the laboratory experiments? These are the experiments in which real subjects make decisions in real situations with real monetary consequences. These are going to be simple and stylized versions of the models that uh, economic theorists write. But they're going to capture the main trade-offs that people face in this particular situation. So the way to look at the laboratory experiment and to say whether uh, we're learning something from it or not is to ask yourself whether this game captures the main forces that work in this similar situation in real life that you want to study. And if the answer is yes, then we can learn something from these laboratory experiments. One advantage of using laboratory experiments is that it allows, it allows causal inferences about the effects of specific changes in the institutional rules on the bargaining outcomes, which again is really, really hard uh, to do uh, with field data. Um, this is how laboratory experiment looks like. This is the picture of our own Caltech uh, social science experimental lab across the hall here, in, uh, across the building in Baxter building. So it's a room with the computers and with cubicles. We invite students to participate in our economic experiments. They come to the lab. We explain to them the rules of the game they're going to be playing. We explain to them, uh, for example, in, this, in, in my experiments, how they're going to bargain with each other, what's the budget, what are the rules that the committee is going to use to reach the decisions. Uh, and all the decisions are going to be made through computer terminals. So people are actually not talking to each other physically, but rather they're typing each other messages through the chat box. 
and I'm going to be able to collect all this data, all this chat data, and analyze that to be able to say how did they reach the decisions they reached. And then our students are also uh, know how do their decisions translate into their payoffs at the end of the experiment. And at the end of the experiment, which usually lasts between one hour and, uh, and two hours, they earn real money. And the trick is to make sure that their decisions affect what amount they earn, just like in real life situations. So depending on their choices and the choices of others, they're going to earn different amounts of money, which can be quite different if you can ask, you can ask our students that participate in this experiment. This is, there's pretty big diversity in payments, which stimulates them to think hard about the situation and behave really how, the, the way they want to. So these are laboratory experiments. All right, let me tell you now what uh, 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 my projects do. So, um, one of the games that I'm going to use a lot is the game, uh, bargaining game between five people. So there's member one, two, three, four, and five that need to divide the budget, which they know what it is. Uh, the bargaining protocol is structured as follows. First, there is a proposal stage. Proposal is randomly chosen uh, from this group of five people. So there is a random device that selects one of these members to be the proposer. The proposer submits an allocation to the whole group, which specifies the shares of all members, shares of member one, two, three, four, and five, such that all these five numbers add up to the budget. In the experience I'm going to show you, the budget is 250 points. After the allocation is proposed, the voting stage starts, at which case all members in the group observe what's the allocation on the floor. So you don't just observe your own share, you observe everyone's share. And then you vote yes or no to accept or to reject this proposal. If majority accepts the proposal, then the allocation is implemented and the game ends. If the majority rejects the proposal, then we're going to go back to the proposal stage, except that we're going to impose uh, the cost on the delay. So after the proposal is rejected, the budget shrinks by 20%. So when the next stage, bargaining stage, starts, instead of 250 points, the group has only 200 points to divide between the five of them, and so forth, until they converge on the allocation. OK. This is, again, a very stylized version of the game, but let me give you some intuition why, what this game represents. So think about the legislative committee, which has five legislators who represent each their own district. Each member wants to appropriate the higher share of resources for his or her own district. The committee uses the majority voting rule, which is the case in many uh, committees out there. And the committee under, uh, uh, rules understand that being the proposer is valuable. Therefore, every member would try to uh, become the proposer and put the proposal on the floor. How can we model the situation? We can assume that there is no bias towards any of these five members. And every member is equally likely to become the proposer in every single stage. The committee task, of course, is to agree on how to allocate this budget. Final element of the game, the discounting, the fact that the budget shrinks following the rejection of the proposal just captures the idea that delays are generally costly. Every representative of the district would like to deliver uh, benefits to his or her own district sooner rather than later. So that's that's why the budget shrinks as, as we go along and continue bargaining without results. So let me tell you what economic theory tells uh, us will happen in this game, should happen in this game. So the first observation is that imagine yourself in the shoes of the proposer. You need to find the majority of the committee who would vote to accept your proposal. We have five people. Presumably, you're going to vote yes for your proposal. So you just need to convince two other members out there to vote with you, which means that if you're going to give anyone some positive shares, you'd rather give this to two members that you think are going to vote with you. And there is absolutely no point to waste the resources on two other people who you don't expect to vote yes for you anyways, and you don't need that, right? You just need the simple majority, three out of five votes. OK, so the proposer should select two members of the committee and offer them positive shares. And I'm going to use the term invite them into the coalition. How much should the proposer give to these two members? 
every member who is not the proposer today can calculate what's the value of rejecting the current share that he is proposed to. Why there's a value to reject the current share? Because if you reject the proposal today, then the next bargaining stage starts, in which case there is some positive chance that you're gonna be the proposer. That's very valuable. You're gonna offer the proposal which favors you. And of course, there's also some chance that you're not the proposer and you're gonna be included into the coalition or not included into the coalition. So in this game, the calculation is quite simple. With probability one-fifth, you're gonna be the proposer next period, in which case, the pie, the budget is gonna be only 200 points, right? Because 20% uh, of the pie disappeared because of the delay. Minus, you have to give two other members of the uh, group positive shares so that they support your proposal and you can appropriate the remaining funds. So this is how much you're paying the two other members and uh, budget minus that is what you can keep for yourself. With probability two fifths, Tomorrow, you're not the proposer, but you're gonna be included in the coalition and you're gonna get this share of the non-proposers. And with probability to fifth, you're getting nothing. You're left out of the coalition. Turns out that the expected payoff of the proposers, of non-proposers to reject the current uh, share is 40, which is exactly how much the proposer should give to other members so that they vote yes for him. In other words, you can add an epsilon there and give them 41. But the point is that if you prefer to appropriate the higher share of resources for yourself, you're gonna find the cheapest way to create the minimum winning coalition and pass it through. So the theory is pretty definitive about what should happen in this game. First of all, in theory we expect no delays whatsoever. All the proposals should pass right away in the very first bargaining stage. Second, only three out of five members should get the positive shares. And the proposer gives 40 points to two randomly selected members and gets huge share for him or herself. In my example, it's 170 points. Two other remaining members get nothing. What should happen in this game if people can communicate with each other? It is really unclear what should happen, but notice that there is not much to talk about in this game. All the parameters of the game are commonly known from the beginning. So the calculation that we just did can be done in your head without talking to anyone. So it's unclear why would people talk to each other in this game. And one of the predictions of the theory would be that we expect the same thing to happen when people can communicate with each other. Let's see what happens. So we ran this experiments at UCLA and we had two different treatments. In one treatment, we played this game uh, without any communication. I'm gonna call it this the baseline treatment. In the other treatment, we um, uh, let subjects use the on-screen chat box in which they can type any messages they want to each other. They can send private messages to individual members of the group. They can also, also send public message will be, which will be delivered to the whole group or any subset of members within a group. So they had complete freedom of who they want to talk to, what do they want to say, and how long they want to talk to each other. So let me run through these theoretical predictions and show you what people do in each of these two treatments. So with respect to delays, theory predicts no delays, and indeed we observe very little delays. By delay, I mean how likely is the game to reach the second bargaining stage, or how many times the first proposals are actually rejected. It's pretty low, less than 50% in both treatments with and without communication. So this first column is gonna always show the theory production, the second column is gonna show the predict, uh, the, what happens in the treatment without communication in the baseline, and the last column is gonna show what happens in the game with communication. Now let's look at the size of the coalition. How many people are getting positive shares in this game? Theory predicts that all the coalitions should consist of three out of five members, so there's gonna be minimum winning coalitions, and there should be absolutely no grand coalitions. Grand coalitions are the coalitions in which all five members get positive shares. In about 80% of cases in the baseline, that's true. People form the minimum winning coalition, and there are about 14% of grand coalitions. In the chat treatment, the ratio is even closer to the theory. 90% of all proposals are minimum winning. 
Now, what about the shares of the uh, coalition members and the proposer? Proposer is expected to get 170 or out of 250 points, and coalition partners should get 40. Now, notice that there is a, there is a quite a big difference uh, in what happens with the share of the proposer between the baseline and the chart treatment. In the baseline treatment, in which people cannot communicate with each other, proposer gets significantly less than what the theory predicts. They get on average 110 points out of 250. So they're leaving a lot of money on the table. They're offering their coalition partners a higher shares than what they expected. That changes when people can communicate with each other. Now, the share of the proposer is closer to the theoretical prediction, and actually the median proposal share, so these are the averages, but the median is about uh, 155. So it seems that proposers use communication tool in some way to extract higher share of resources, which is completely opposite from what has happened in the ultimatum game, right? Talk, me talking to my brother helped me get the game that I also wanted. The shares were more egalitarian. Here it's the opposite. Communication and negotiations in the large committees increase the uh, proposer power and lead to allocations which are less egalitarian. So what's going on? This is where the communication is gonna help me. I'm gonna analyze the uh, uh, communication chats and try to understand the mechanism how people got to these results. Here is two most common conversations that people engage in. This is exa in the example one, uh, proposer was member four and member two of the committee first sent a private message to the proposer saying, I'm gonna vote for you if you give me 50. And then the first member sent a message to the proposer saying, hi, shoot me 40 for an auto, yes. And then the third guy said to the proposer, I'm good with 50, okay? So in this first conversation, there are a lot of bilateral talk where the non-proposer sending messages to the proposer saying, what are their requirements to vote yes for the current proposal? The second conversation is different. In the second conversation, the proposer initiates uh, this information by asking it from the non-proposers. So the proposer sent the message to member two saying, how much will it take for you to vote? Two says 50. Then proposer gets greedy and says, what about 40? And two says, sure. Okay. So these two types of conversations actually cover vast majority of all the conversations that we observed in this experiment. So, how does negotiations actually help the proposer to reach higher shares to exert their power? I'm gonna bring you the elements, the few um, results from the data, and I'm gonna, then I'm gonna summarize this mechanism. But I'm sure you're gonna see, you, you already see where I'm going with this. So first of all, most of the conversations that we observe in this case are backroom deals. There are one-to-one -one conversations between the proposer and the non-proposer. Subjects very, uh, only very few subjects send messages that are delivered to the entire group. Non-proposers tend to send the messages to the proposers by revealing what are their reservation value. In other words, what is the share that they're gonna accept if they offer this share? That happens in more than 90% of all the conversations. Interestingly enough, even though this communication is complete cheap talk, you can say anything you want, the messages that people send are mostly truthful. And the way we know it is by looking at how do you vote depending on what you have said in the negotiation stage. It turns out that if you were offered at least the amount that you stated in conversations, then 96% of the time you're gonna accept the proposal. But if you offered less than what, than, than what you asked, you're gonna vote no on this proposal. So the proposers can trust the messages that they observe. And then their job is very easy. They just need to pick two cheapest members of the committee, offer them the shares, and appropriate the remaining resources. So the effect that's responsible for all our results here is the competition effect. Non-proposers compete for the place in the coalition, knowing that only two of them are gonna get positive shares, and the remaining two will get nothing. They compete with each other, by lowering their reservation prices, and the proposer exploit that to their advantage. So it turns out that in the committees with more than two people, negotiations lead to less egalitarian outcomes through this use of what we call the backroom deals. 
So summarizing the effects of this negotiation, I can see two channels which help the proposers to extract more resources from this committee. The first channel is the information channel. Negotiations mitigates the uncertainty that the proposer has about the reservation prices of committee members. And the second effect is the competition effect, which means that people fear being left out of the coalition, and that's why once they were left out of the coalition, they're gonna lower their reservation price in order to be including, included in the coalition in the next round. Okay, so that's the first result that we got. Now let me relate it back to the discussion of the backroom deals and legislative process that I started with. Um, as you all know, the US Constitution mandates that each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings. This mandate is in place for a very important reason. The congressional records should list everything that has been said on the floor during the process that we're passing bills in order to be uh, able for public and other politicians to hold, hold accountable the politicians who pass these bills. Even though there are a lot of congressional records out there and a lot of things are documented, we all know that politicians routinely engage in backroom dealings. And one example of that is the Universal Healthcare Act, which had a number of provisions with very colorful names, which indicated that some senators got a special provisions within a bill in exchange for their yes vote. So here's a few examples. Louisiana Purchase, Gattergate, uh, Conhacker Kickback, Montana Earmark, New England Handouts, Dot Cleaning, and so forth. So each of these um, um, terms captures a specific provision to the bill which was offered to a specific state or uh, region in exchange for the yes vote for this act. Backroom dealing seemed to be uh, discussed a lot in these days, and it has been an object of political outcry for at least a decade. Here is a quote from former Senator uh, Jeff Session, who says, Senators where the great issues of our times are supposed to be examined, reviewed, and discussed before the whole nation. Yet in the last few years, we have witnessed the dramatic erosion of senators' rights and the dismantling of the open legislative process. All of us, both parties, have responsibility to stop and reverse these trends. It's, the na it's in our national interest. It's the right thing to do. All of us owe our constituents an open, deliberative process where the great issue of the day are debated in full and open public view. The democratic process is messy, sometimes contentious, and often difficult. But it's precisely this legislative tug of war, this back and forth, which forges national consensus. While secret deals may keep the trains running on time, they often keep them running in the wrong direction. So this is quite a strong view against the backroom deals and quid pro quos. Now what do we do since that uh, uh, thing happens all the time? So there have been two approaches proposed to deal with this problem. The first approach um, proposes to force transparency remove the backroom deals using some kind of an enforcement mechanism and force all the communication to be public. Uh, the, there are many proponents of that approach. Uh, here's another quote from uh, Senator Jim DeMint, who was a, the chairman of the Senate Steering Committee at the time. He says, Americans are disgusted by the earmarks, kickbacks, and backroom deals. And 10 days later, he proposes the amendment that would ban the practice of trading earmarks for votes. There were several other senators that supported this approach. So this is one approach. It says backroom deals are a bad thing. Let's ban them. Let's force all the communication to be public. The second approach is different. It proposes to change the voting rule that the committees used to pass these bills. So the proposal is to increase the size of the majority needed to pass the bill, in which case it would be impractical to conduct these backroom deals. So this is a more indirect way to get rid of the backroom deals by increasing the size of the majority that's required to pass the bill. So for example, uh, another senator uh, proposed requiring a 60 vote threshold and he says that it helps ensure that we have a meaningful debate rather than a series of backroom deals to push. Um, so the second proposal essentially 
um, proposes to reduce, to eliminate the competition effect, which was responsible for the backroom deals to begin with. So what are we going to do in the next project is we're going to try to examine these two approaches. And we're going to try to think a little bit about what is the transparency of the negotiation process buys us? What results does it lead us to? We're going to ask precisely, uh, we're going to analyze these two approaches by first uh, increasing the size of the majority required to pass outcomes. And then we're going to see what happens when, instead of increasing the size of the majority, we're going to just impose the transparency. And we're going to force all the conversations between the bargainers to be public. And finally, we're going to ask under what conditions transparency arises by itself endogenously, which would be a wonderful thing, so we don't need to regulate anything. Um, the answers to this question turn out to be a bit more complicated than we expected. It turns out that the answers crucially depend on two elements. The first element is the degree of the consensus required to pass bills, so the voting rule in place. And the second element is the communication structure available to the bargainers. So let me show you now the whole uh, project. So in this project, we're going to vary two dimensions. We're going to vary the degree of the competition between non-proposers. We're going to look at the committees that use the majority voting rule, in which I argued before there's a lot of competitions between non-proposers. And we're going to look at the low competition case, or actually no competition case, the committees that use the unanimity rule. There are many committees that use this rule in reality, so this is a very relevant rule to study. Second, we're going to vary the availability of communication. Uh, we're going to look at the committees that use no communication at all, committees that have access to all communication, and committees that have access only to the public communication, in which case you can't send private messages to the individual members of the group. So this is public communication is kind of enforcing no uh, backroom deals by definition. We're going to use exactly the same game as before. There is a committee with five members. There's a budget of 250 points. Uh, and the only difference in the structure of the game is whether the committee uses the majority or the unanimity rule. In both cases, the theory predicts that we should observe no delays. We should always observe the minimum winning coalition. But notice that in the majority case, the minimum winning coalition consists of three out of five members. But in the un unanimity rule, Minimum winning coalitions are all five members. So we should expect all members to get positive shares in this case. And the proposal share depends, of course, on whether uh, we're in the majority or unanimity case. In majority case, proposers have enormous power. They appropriate more than half of all the resources, 170 points. In unanimity, the proposers appropriate only 90 points because they need to give positive shares to four other members in this group. So what's left for them is only 90 points. And we expect the same predictions when communication is available, at least based on the intuition that it's unclear what people are going to be talking here about. Let me show you what happens. The first uh, question is whether we observe any delay in bargaining. So there are five bars in this graph. The first three refer to the majority treatment and to each of the treatments without communication, with unrestricted communication, and the public communication. And the last two are two treatments for the unanimity case, without communication, and with communication. So in the majority case, there is not much delay in either of the treatments. It's less than 15%. The situation is very different in the unanimity case. In unanimity case, when people cannot talk to each other, when negotiations are banned altogether, there are a lot of delays. More than 40% of first round proposals are rejected, and people reach the second round, even after experiencing this game for a while. Communication seems to help with this problem. Once people can talk to each other, the frequency of disagreements significantly decreases from 40% to about 6%. What happens with the proposers' shares? So the first two bars we've already talked about in the majority case, when People cannot communicate with each other. They appropriate, on average, 110 points out of 250. So in this graph, I'm plotting everything as a fraction of the theoretical prediction. So this is a line at 1. So in no communication case, people appropriate a little bit over 60% of the resources, of the theoretically predicted resources that the proposer should appropriate. When people can talk without any restrictions, the share of proposers significantly increases. 
Now, when you force all the communication to be public, it goes back down to exactly the same level as it was before any communication was introduced. An absolutely different thing happens in the unanimity treatment. When you compare the proposal share with unrestricted communication and with no communication at all, communication seemed to decrease the proposal share. So hopefully by now I completely confused you about the effects of the negotiations because I showed you that in one case it goes out, uh, up and the other it goes down. In the third case it doesn't matter. So um, what's going on here? Let's go back to the, uh, to, okay, let me tell you one more thing and then I'll tell you the, the um, solution of this puzzle. Let me show you uh, what happens with the size of the coalitions and all these treatments. So in majority case, we expect only to see three person coalitions. And that's indeed the case in all three treatments, at least in the majority of the committees, with the lowest share of the minimum winning coalitions being in the public communication treatment. In unanimity, we expect to see no three person coalitions. And that's indeed the case in both treatments. Four-person coalitions are not predicted by theory in either of the treatments, and indeed, the, all these numbers are very, very small. We almost don't see four-person coalitions. What about five-person coalitions? We see quite a few grant coalitions in the majority treatment without communication and with public communication, and we see that all coalitions are five-person coalitions in the unanimity case. A few things to note is that in the public communication treatment, in the majority case, almost quarter of all proposals are exact equal splits. What are these uh, exact equal splits? We have five people and 250 points. Exact equal split means that everybody gets 50. In the unanimity case, when people don't talk, these equal splits are quite rare. But when people do talk to each other before voting, essentially all the data looks like equal splits. Okay, so this is, uh, where are we catching the same effect as before? By letting people talk in the unanimity treatment, proposers just give up their power altogether. They earn, in most of the cases, exactly the same as anyone else in the group. So, what's going on? Why are these effects all going into different directions? Again, my answer is gonna lie in the communication, analyzing the communication. So, looking at the communication charts, we identify two types of messages which essentially span all the data. One type of message we classify as statements which lobby for fairness and equality. So these are the statements along the lines, uh, equal is nice, let's just do 50 each, just play fair, and there are a lot of them. The other types of messages, these are the messages that lobby for self-interest. These are the same messages we used to observe in the majority uh, case, which say, I'm good with 50, I'll vote for you if you give me 50, hi, shoot me 40 for another yes. So most of the messages that we observe are fall into one of these two categories. What's interesting is that which types of messages people use in different treatments. So in this table, I'm gonna divide all the messages into the public messages, those that are sent to the entire group. These are the things that people say in public and publish in newspapers. And these are the private messages which are sent one-to-one -to, -one to the proposer or to one other member of the group. Within each of this category, I have these two, uh, two groups that I just discussed. There are messages in which people lobby for fairness, and there are messages in which people lobby for themselves. Right? And the same two categories for the private messages. One column is gonna talk about the majority unrestricted uh, communication treatment, and another about unanimity. So in the majority committees, uh, there are quite few public messages that are sent. So only about 15% of subjects through uh, entire experiment sent some public message to the entire group. On the contrary, in the majority case, most people send these private messages. These are the backroom deals, bilateral messages with the proposer um, talking about the uh, self-interest. In the unanimity, the situation is quite different. Most of the communication is public, and almost none of it is private. Now, what do people talk about? Whenever they talk in public, whenever public message is sent, it doesn't matter which, which voting rule you're using, most of the messages are about fairness, equality, and being nice to each other. That happens in more than 75% of the cases in both voting treatments. 
When people talk in private, they mostly talk about themselves. They mostly talk about the deals they want to make for themselves. So this is uh, the solution to all my puzzles. It turns out that competition between the non-proposers affect not just the bargaining outcomes, but it affects how the communication tool is used. And it affects for what purpose people use this communication tool. When there is a high competition between non-proposers for a place in the coalition, most of the conversations are um, private. And these backroom deals are entirely about self-interest. So we don't see any transparency in, in the bargaining process. When the competition is low, as in case in the unanimity treatment, most of the messages are public. And in public, people tend to talk about fairness. So in the unanimity treatment, you don't need to enforce transparency. Transparency arises by itself through the nature of the bargaining process. Uh, and just like before, just like in the majority treatment, uh, in the first experiment, proposers take negotiations seriously. In the unanimity case, for example, the proposers respond strongly to whether anyone sent a fair, equal message in the public. And depending on that, they offer a higher or lower share to the coalition partners and take lower share for themselves. OK. One last bit about these two policy approaches. When you impose transparency uh, by design, when you remove all the possibilities of backroom deals, what happens is that people start talking much less to each other. They negotiate less in public. Because as we saw in the unrestricted case, what they really want to do is they want to make these backroom deals. Once you prevent them from doing that, public conversations are not the substitute for what the, for the conversations they had in private. Instead, we observe that there is very little talk at all in public. There is some talk about the fairness and equality, which is why we observe some significant fraction of the equal splits in the public communication case. But more importantly, proposers cannot use the negotiations to their advantage, and they earn a significantly lower share than what they did before. OK, so I hope, hopefully I convinced you by now that there are two different factors and uh, their interaction is what's important to determine how negotiations affect the bargaining outcomes. And these two ingredients that we have to take into account together are the degree of the competition between bargainers and the structure of the communication. If you just look at one of them in isolation and look at it at different environments, you're going to get different answers. So it's the interaction between uh, the voting rule and the communication channels that determines the bargaining outcome. OK. Um, in the last few minutes, I want to tell you about the project that I'm currently working on. Um, so this is the project in which, as opposed to previous two projects, um, we're going to introduce some asymmetries between bargainers. So in the previous games, all five members of the group were absolutely identical. Right? There was no uh, um, uh, bargaining strength attached to each of those members. But in many situations, in many bargaining situations, uh, there are differences between bargainers. And the question is whether uh, people can identify the bargaining powers of different members of the committee and use this to their advantage. So think about any negotiation process. If you know who is the weak bargainer and you can use it to your advantage, then you can appropriate a higher share of resources. So, this is the question we're asking here. Are people able to recognize uh, who has higher bargaining power and use that to their advantage? So we're going to do it in a very, very simple game, which resembles the ultimatum game that um, I introduced at the very beginning. So there are going to be three members. Member A is going to be the proposer. And he's going to propose how to allocate this time 240 points between the three of them. So it's easy to divide. So member A chooses share for, member, uh, uh, for he, him or herself, share for member B, and share for member C, such that these three numbers sum up to 240. After the proposal is made, everybody observes this proposal, and they vote. If the majority approves this proposal, then the proposed allocation is implemented, and the game ends. If the proposal is rejected by the majority, by at least two out of three members, then the game ends, but each member appropriates the default payoffs. 
So think about these default payoffs as, for example, the previous budget allocation that passed in the previous round and in, in the previous year, and in order to pass the new one, you have to overrule the previous status quo. So according to this uh, uh, previous uh, budget allocation, member A gets 10, member B gets 10, and member C gets disproportionate part of 220, okay? So it's exactly the ultimatum game with three members only and the majority voting rule, except that people have different default values if the proposal is rejected. Um, you know, I was once told my, by my uh, advisor that uh, talking to uh, an experimental economist is a little bit like going to the dinner at the cannibal's house. Sometimes you're a diner, sometimes you're part of the dinner, and sometimes you're both. So I'm gonna ask for your help, guys, and I'm gonna ask you to think about this game for a minute and think what would you do if you were playing this game and you were member A. And the question that I wanted to think about is would you offer a positive share to member B or to member C or to both of them? Can you please show me with your hands how many people would offer a positive share to member B? Great. How many people would offer a positive share to member C? Okay. And how many people would offer positive shares to both of them? Okay. Let me show you what Caltech students and students from UC Irvine would do in this game. And you can see where you're on this graph. So this is looking at the accepted proposals. Um, most people offer about 80% of the accepted proposals include member A and member B only. So only member B gets the positive share in this game. There are very few coalitions which consist of member A and C and quite few coalitions, oh, about 20% uh, that consist of all three members. And the yellow bars are the Caltech, of course, students, and the purple bars are the UC Irvine students. So why did most people choose to give positive shares to member uh, B? So the reasoning is, the reasoning is the following. When you're thinking uh, as member A, you'd like to get the higher share for yourself. Now, what would it take to uh, invite member C into the coalition? Member C gets a lot of money if, he rejects the, if the proposal is rejected. So this is a very expensive bargainer. There's a cheaper uh, bargainer out there. It's member B. You need to offer this guy only a little bit above 10 to convince him to vote yes for you. And since we only need two out of three votes to pass the proposal, it makes sense to invite member B, give him a little bit more than 10 points, and appropriate the rest for yourself. All right, very good. Now let me make this game a little bit more complicated. Uh, the first part of the game is exactly identical. Member A chooses three shares that sum up to 240 points, and then people vote. If the majority approves, then the game ends, and this is the proposed allocation. And if the majority rejects, then there's a second round of bargaining in which member B is the proposer now. Member B now also chooses how to share the budget, 240 points between the three of them, after which case, all people vote. If the second round proposal is accepted by the majority rule, then the proposed allocation is implemented. If it's rejected, then members get the same default payoffs as we did before in the first part of this experiment. So member A gets 10, member B gets 10, and member C gets 220 points, okay? So this part, the second bargaining part is the new in this experiment. I'm gonna ask you to think about exactly the same question. Think about being member A, being the proposer in the very first bargaining round. Who would you like to invite into the coalition now? Please raise your hand if you would like to invite member B into the coalition. All right. How many people would like to invite member C into the coalition? How many people would you like uh, to invite both of them? Yes, well, yeah, good, great. Let me show you what happens in, in the actual experiment. Um, first of all, 
even without looking at my labels, you can see that the purple and the orange bars are quite different now. People behave differently. Caltech students behave differently from uh, Irvine students. Irvine students mostly invite member B into the coalition, just like before. So they do exactly the same thing as they did in the first part of the experiment, but there, there was no second stage of, uh, uh, of the game. Caltech students rarely do so. They mostly invite member C in the coalition rather than member B. Let me argue that Caltech students are right. <laughs> think about this game. One way to think through this complicated game is to think backwards. Let's first think what would happen if we reach the second bargaining stage. In the second bargaining stage, member B needs to think who is the weaker bargainer in this group. Um, member B would, of course, invite member A because he only needs to give A a little bit over 10 and get the rest for himself. So if we ever reach second st bargaining stage, it means that member C gets nothing. And member A gets some positive share. And member B gets a lot. Therefore, when you're in the very first bargaining stage, recognizing that, member A should actually invite member C into the coalition because he is the cheaper one, despite the fact that his default value is much higher than the member B. All right. So what is this experiment about? Um, there are many situations in which knowing who you can form the coalition with the cheapest possible way is extremely useful. But it turns out that identifying weak bargainers in, uh, in the situations is not such an easy task as, as you probably saw for yourself. Um, it's not easy to do. and. The difficulty lies usually in the structure and the complexity of the bargaining situation. We could play this game with five steps of reasoning or 25 steps of reasoning and see how further away people can, can think through this game. And the ability of the bargainers to think through the game strategically, meaning thinking backwards and uh, kind of uh, collapsing the tree into a very simple game. So what we're working right now in this project, this is work in progress. That's why I, I asked you to, to vote on how would you behave, because I'm just curious. Um, we're still working on understanding what are other determinants of the bargaining power. In this experiment, that was the default uh, values. What else matters? How else we can understand who is the stronger and who is the weaker bargainer in this situation? I, I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to thank my wonderful collaborators on all these projects. There are Chloe Turgeman, who is at Penn State University, Tom Palfrey, who is here at Caltech, Najiba Lee from Penn State University, and Doug Bernheim from Stanford. Thank you very much, and I'll take some questions. <laughs>